The question why were prehistoric animals so big comes up a lot, and it's a fair question I suppose. After all, how many really big animals, or megafauna, do we have around today? Let's say weighing a ton or more. On land there's elephants, hippos, rhinos, giraffes, camels, a few species of buffalo and the occasional hibernation ready bear. In the sea there's walruses, elephant seals, a few big sharks, manta rays, sunfish and of course whales. That's about it for species and their populations are usually fairly small as well. That makes sense right? Big animals need a lot of space and food so naturally they can't be too common or they'll knacker the food chain. But somehow throughout prehistory there have consistently been giant animals living side by side in greater diversity, populations and indeed sizes than anything about today. There must have been something crazy going on with the world to accommodate such an abundance of absolute units. Was it the atmosphere? Were the plants hypernutritious? Was gravity different? But what if I told you that the way you think the natural world works is a lie that you've told yourself? Open your mind and question your own perceptions as I present to you the shifting baseline. It's a kind of subconscious psychological bias that affects the way we interpret the world around us. It was first put forward by Scottish landscape architect Ian McCarg in 1969 as a way of comparing historical landscapes to modern ones, but it was applied to an ecological context by French marine biologist Daniel Pauly. Pauly was investigating how the fishing industry was managing its stocks, how they assess fish populations and set their catch quotas accordingly, and he noticed something rather odd. Instead of looking at natural populations of marine life, they were basing their assessments on the fish populations that they were familiar with, which had already been heavily fished for decades. This is the basic idea behind the shifting baseline. Each new generation grows up with the natural world in a slightly different condition, and that familiarity means those conditions end up being considered normal. So maybe we shouldn't be asking why was prehistoric life so big, because for the last few hundred million years that's been pretty ordinary. With whole continents of unbroken wilderness and millions of years of relatively stable climate, animals have had the time, space and resources to evolve and specialise and find solutions to life's challenges with plenty of opportunities for some of them to grow absolutely f***ing enormous. Turns out it's the modern world that's weird for having so few megafauna, so maybe we should be asking why is modern life so small? Well we're only about 10,000 years past a major extinction event at the end of the last ice age, which isn't enough time for new megafauna to evolve. To make things worse, a few centuries worth of human hunting, habitat destruction and climate change have drastically reduced diversity in populations of wild animals, even altering the course of evolution to favour smaller body sizes. By assessing historical and fossil records, it seems that the natural world, in its most unscrewed up condition, should be absolutely bursting with healthy populations of animals of all shapes and sizes, to such an extreme that it's almost impossible to imagine. Before the commercial whaling industry, the seas were home to over 350,000 blue whales, and now there's less than a percent of that. A few centuries ago, hundreds of thousands of tigers roamed across Asia, and now less than 5,000 live in just 5% of their former habitat. And less than 100 years ago, Africa was home to 10 million elephants, which seems like an insane high number. But that's the point, it's our perception of what we think is normal. This period of time that human civilization occupies is a tiny blip on the evolutionary timescale. The combination of natural and man-made disasters means we live in a time of unusually low biodiversity. Now is the anomaly, but thanks to the shifting baseline we don't realise it. And that's a problem. Without the context of knowing what a genuinely healthy earth looks like, it's far too easy to lose track of how much damage has actually been done. So after asking why was prehistoric life so big and why is modern life so small, maybe the next question we should be asking is, will future life ever get to be big again? Hey, thanks for watching. This video was made possible by its supporters on Patreon. If you want to help out the channel, you can get behind the scenes material, ad free early access, and for top tier patrons like Carl Zuri Lu and Cedric Sammy, a personal shout out. See you later.